Yes, Mr. Saidi, but can you just formulate what will be your line of uh, uh, argument? With my Lord's permission, given that I have only 20 minutes, and which I expect may not even happen, I'll do my best to simply formulate my position. And as opposed to reading out from anything, kindly allow me to just engage in the bench. Because my written submissions capture my position that's already been shared. So there are two aspects. Just give us one second. We'll just Please. go to your written submissions. So as we are arguing, we can also uh, keep a track of your submission. If I may, uh, an additional written submission. Additional submissions or the written, original one? The original. The additional is a one-page note. And I'll anyway address it. So my could perhaps refer to the first written submission. So what is broadly the line of... Uh, Milaj, if I may say so. The first law of thermodynamics effectively encapsulates the entire position when it comes to physics. And from there, or uh, corollaries flow. So the central position that is effectively placed before my lords is with respect to the distinction between fetters and powers, which is to say that this particular area which the petitioners seek to espouse before my lords is an area which falls within either prohibited areas or is it something that falls within the area for my lords' adjudication. That is the central issue. And I think that is the forest that is thought to be presented before my lords. I am here to perhaps unpack a few leaves for my lords' consideration. The question of legislative competence is just one aspect of the issue which hinges on separation of powers. But I go a step further, which is to say that when the petitions raise the question of change in heteronormative attitudes, does the society have a right of agency to participate in these proceedings or not, at least in this particular issue or not? Because this is not a question of separation of territories between different organs of the state, but it fundamentally hinges on the right or the agency of the society to participate in this particular discussion. And that is the central problem in these kind of issues and subjects are taken up by the court of law, <laughs> as opposed to leaving it for legislative prerogative to apply its mind. Point number two, during the course of these proceedings of the last two weeks, quite a few times I've heard the submission being made that it's a liberal democracy, it's a liberal document, it's a liberal document, so on and so forth. Does it mean that social conservatism has, absol conservatism has absolutely no place within the meaning of the constitution? Does it mean that the society does not have the right to draw a few red lines to basically say thus far and no further? That is the central question. I represent a women's organization which equally represents the right of children. And therefore, as a civil society organization, the question that is being raised is that the nature of the prayers raised in the petition has the consequence of individualizing a socio-centric institution such as marriage, which is to say, as long as it is a transaction that takes place between two individuals who are consenting and who are not prohibited by any prohibition of degrees, so to speak, the rest of the society has absolutely no say as far as this institution is concerned. This, I'm sorry to say, fundamentally demeans the institution of marriage and takes away its social character. That, so these are the meta questions that I think which arise for consideration before this honorable court when these kind of petitions are filed. I'm sorry to say this and, and let me try and perhaps tone down the rigor of my submission to the extent of saying I believe that they have a cause. I just don't believe they have a case. The cause is different from the case. And it is important for the court to seriously consider one aspect here. When there are issues of legislative competence, there's another figure, so to speak, which is involved. And that figure's powers come under Article 111 of the Constitution, which is to say that if a legislative proposal ultimately meets with the consent of both the houses, ultimately it has to go to the Honorable President. And the Honorable President also has the power to recommend amendments to a legislation. Therefore, this is not just a question of legislative prerogative or legislative sovereignty, either from an external or an internal perspective, but there are multiple dramatis personae and stakeholders of this particular equation, the society being the chief, because ultimately the petitions raise the question of changing the paradigm with respect to heteronormative attitudes of legislations in general. It is not just about the SMA. Plus, my lords is not dealing with the religion specific legislation here, it is the SMA which means all the more the society's participation when it comes to the SMA is warranted, is mandated, is compulsory. Because at least if it were to be with respect to certain, let's say, religion-specific legislations, it can be said that there is an identifiable group which has a locus to argue here. But when it comes to the SMA, it can't be the argument that only those who subscribe to the values of SMA are allowed to participate in these proceedings. Secondly, as has been already submitted, Section 21 of the SMA has a direct bearing on personal laws. So even with respect to SMA, the society has a right to participate. The reason why the additional written submissions become relevant is because I filed an annexure, which is the Manual for Parliamentary Procedure of 2019, which was published by the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs. And that particular manual, so to speak, has Chapter 9, which deals with the business of legislation. 
close to 30 clauses exist detailing the manner in which a legislative proposal is to be considered in the first place, how the ball is set rolling. And in that, if I may, if I may just refer to my uh, additional written submission here, okay. I'll walk my lots through the relevant portion here. Additional written submission, Milot, has a copy been given to the other side? Please hand it over. We have it here. Please, Milot. So, para one effectively has captured my position with respect to Article 111, but the second paragraph is where I place reliance on the Manual of Parliamentary Procedures. Does my lords have it? Yes, okay. we have. For the benefit of the bench, may I just read this out? Which para? Uh, para 9 2, 2, page 2. Uh, para 9.2? Exactly. Exactly. So, para 2. So, I'm reading out from the written submission because oh, that oh, okay. captures. Right, right, right. And the uh, the document itself is, annex is annexed. So, let me just read out the submission, my lords. May yes. I? Yes. Please. Does the rest of the bench have it? Yes. In okay. addition to the above. Please. In addition to the above. So, can I just read out para 1 for the sake of completion? I'm so sorry. May I? Please. Yes. It is humbly submitted that apart from circumvention of legislative prerogative and sovereignty, violation of the doctrine of separation of powers seriously impinges and encroaches upon presidential prerogative under Article 111 of the Constitution. Under the said article, firstly, the Honorable President has the right to receive the bill for his assent after it is passed by both houses of Parliament. This translates to countervailing obligations on the Parliament to present the bill for the Honorable President's assent. Further, under the article, not only does the Honorable President have the right to withhold assent, but also the power to recommend amendments and also reconsideration of certain specific provisions in a certain bill. Now, paragraph number two. In addition to the above, reliance is also placed on the Manual of Parliamentary Procedures issued by the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs in July 2019, which contains a specific chapter, chapter nine, titled Legislation. My apologies for the speed. I'm just trying to keep up with time here. Please. The said chapter spells out in great detail the steps to be undertaken in promulgating a legislation. Critically, Clause 9.2 deals with the pre-drafting stage of a legislative proposal, which is divided into four broad stages that include consultation between the concerned ministry to which the legislative proposal relates and the Ministry of Law and Justice. Critically, the latter ministry shall review the legislative proposal for legal and constitutional feasibility, validity, as also, and here I quote, necessity and desirability of such a proposal. Clause 9.5, envisages approval of the cabinet followed by an assent, assentment, sorry, assent, under, sorry, assessment under clause 9.6 of the expenditure involved. Critically, clause 9.7.1, envisages securing the recommendation of the Honorable President after the introduction of the bill, which is different from the assent sought under Article 111. Then, Milots, clause 9.12 speaks of the possible referral of that particular bill to a select committee or a joint committee or for circulation for public opinion. If I may say so, and I say this with the deepest of respect and the greatest of humility that I can command at this point, that the judicial mechanism cannot be a substitute to any of these steps, especially when it comes to such a serious issue. And I draw from Hindu law here that the purpose of marriage or the, the object of dampatya is a child, is procreation. Now, therefore, comes the central question with respect to all the permutations and combinations which my lot posed by way of circumstances. What happens to a single child? What happens to a single parent? What happens if it's a homosexual single parent? So on and so forth. Allow me to answer this question in a slightly different fashion. Public morality is decided by normative attitudes. The norm is decided primarily by the mainstream. This is not a majoritarian argument. This is a statement of fact in a democracy. Point number two. When normative attitudes are sought to be revisited, to say that those who constitute the norm don't get to participate in this discussion, because that particular process and that particular, let's say, dance of democracy is sought to be circumvented by using the instrumentality of the court to secure a certain outcome, I'm sorry to say, defeats the purpose of advocacy. Those who are interested in convincing the society are expected to engage with the rest of the society to make good their cause. The judiciary cannot be a substitute to this particular process because then that effectively replaces societal cogitation with, I'm sorry to use the words, judicial paternalism. That can't happen. Three. The benefit of revisitation of a judgment with respect to such sensitive issues, even if it exists by way of clarifications, I'm sorry to say it's not an adequate substitute, it's a suboptimal substitute. Because if the principle that has been established by several judgments is that a judgment is not to be read in the manner of a statute, then there is no precision which can be imparted to the language or findings. And therefore, the principles of statutory interpretation don't apply. So we are left with greater uncertainty.
Please, please, please. The point that I'm perhaps trying to make, and which is what I'm trying to draw the court's attention to, is that the Nalsar judgment that they placed reliance upon extensively, there is a plus and there is perhaps a downside to it. The plus is the judgment must be read in its context. And the issue was the recognition of a third gender. That was what it was limited itself to. And therefore, to extrapolate the findings of the particular judgment, which primarily concerned itself with self-perception, self-identification in the context of gender identity, to extend it to a marital transaction or a marriage-like transaction is to read a judgment for what it is not. Secondly, there are only three in places. I think we, we perhaps are aware of yeah. how to read these judgments. Please, please. We don't need it, need to be taught. No, Milat, I'm sorry. I understand. I'm just placing reliance on this. I'm just making Yes, we up. understand that these are please, contexts. Please. please. Whether they're analogies or not is up to us. My lots. Please, Milat. I'm grateful. The second point is, in fact, on a closer reading of this particular judgment, certain inconsistencies emerge between the two opinions of the very same bench in terms of what constitutes sexual orientation, what con constitutes gender identity. Now, that is natural because there is a discussion that's going on there. It is not to be read in the same manner as a statute. In fact, therefore, the judgment, which doesn't exactly help their position, also points to a certain problem with respect to judicial revisitation of some of these aspects. And the judgment of, just, of, of Arun Kumar of the Madras High Court is actually in the teeth of the submissions being made here which is to say narrow language being expanded through judicial interpretation contrary to legislative intent and history is to rewrite legislative history and judicial reinscription, which is retrospective in nature, may not be exactly permissible. That's one. Then uh, the submission with respect to international law, all the general instruments apart, the Yogyakarta principle specifically clause 24.E specifically leaves it to countries to decide if they wish to have recognition with respect to marital unions. So it's not as if there is some kind of a binding precedent here or there's not, there's no international instrument that's, that says that you shall. I'm not arguing for it should not be. Kindly let this caveat is important. I'm simply saying if the door of judicial intervention in this matter is open for one case, even though the cause may be worthy, what does it do for the future? Because ultimately it's not just a, it's not just a question of one matter. It's a question of the future as well. So therefore, there are specific aspects that relate to the issue in question, and there are general aspects that relate to the separation of powers and societal participation that go well beyond this matter. In light of this, my only humble submission is that there are other issues to be dealt with, and allow me to just point this out and use this particular forum to advocate only one aspect, having actually engaged with certain transgender activists and also having worked with them. I know for a fact that one of the biggest problems is trafficking, them being pushed into prostitution, them not having legitimate livelihoods. I am not reducing or dismissing anybody's concerns with respect to what is their priority. Let me clarify that. I'm not making the submission at all. But these are certain Maslow's needs which have to be completed first and which have to be addressed first before we get to the next step. That's all I have to submit. I'm so grateful for the kind. Please, please. Great. Deeply obliged.